Hello, everyone. Today, I am so excited because our guest is Phil Lockwood, and Phil is CEO, actually founder and CEO of Distill Marketing Agency. And I met Phil because we were working together with his son, Colt, who is an ENTP. Phil is an INTP, super fascinating personality type, and that stands for introverted, intuitive, thinking, and perceiving. And Phil, I don't know if you remember me telling you this, but I grew up with an INTP. So yeah, I just want to know what Phil was like as a kid. Uh, you know, I, I think that it could be any number of different directions that we could go with that, but I was, I was very creative. <laughs> Um, yeah. so I like, got into art as a kid and was very good at drawing and that, uh, you know, between that and wanting to be a pilot since I was about two years old, that pretty much dominated everything that I did and thought and said and focused on. So now hold on. So how did you decide at two years old that you wanted to be a pilot? How did that <laughs> come about? Was your father a pilot? How were you exposed to that? I could never get a straight answer from my parents. And of course, I was too little to even remember. My mom jokes that I came out when I was born. I came out going, like making an airplane. <laughs> my hand. But I do remember going to a Thunderbirds air show when I was really little. I don't remember if that was because I was into aviation or if it happened the other way around. Uh -huh. uh, I remember flying in an airplane with some friends of my parents when I was about that same age. So it's possible that it was during that period of time or... Could have been a toy that I got when I was even younger than that. So I really have no idea, but as long as I can remember. Wow, that's so interesting. And then you were really singular focused on, mm -hmm. on that. Um, but that has not been the case for you because that's kind of not typical of an INTP. And INTP has multitudinal, is that a word, interests, you know? <laughs> um, so they're possibilitarian you know, possibilities are your friend, you know? And so has that always been the case for your singular focus or have you had all these diverse interests? Well, I would say it's kind of a combination in the sense that when there's something that I find I have an interest in, I kind of um, I really focus on that. I mean, to the point of just being obsessed with it almost, mm -hmm. but that, that focus tends to change. <laughs> so this is kind of where this whole concept of always be changing, which is one of our corporate values and then turned into our family values really came from, uh, you could call it shiny object, object syndrome or, <laughs> you know, whatever. But yeah, uh, I, I would say it's amazing that I went through my entire childhood thinking pilot, 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 because now the, the time span for these interests tends to be maybe more in months or sometimes even weeks versus years. <laughs> yeah, so what Phil just talked about was always be changing ABC. That is his YouTube channel. And why don't you talk about that, how that came about, Phil, as one of your changes. You did a really quick flip from suburbia, well, to beach. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> just real quickly summarize that, where that's coming from. Yeah. So again, always be changing the concept here is that, it, you know, some people think of it as a bad thing if you switch from one thing to another, but the reality is that's my personality. Erin, my wife's very on board with it. She's very supportive. So we've just decided that the concept of constant change is one of our, one of our core values. And last year, it was a little over a year ago, we decided to sell our house in Denver, which we had pretty much just finished customizing to sell that and then instead buy in Coronado where we've enjoyed vacationing as a family for I don't know, a better part of a decade. So decided to kind of document that journey by doing videos of that and primarily on YouTube but other social channels as well. And just kind of, I don't know, try to connect with other people who maybe can appreciate that mindset even if they don't share that mindset uh, of uh, constant change in life, you know? And if, if there's something you wanna do, do it, do it frequently, do it as quickly as you can. Um, don't put things off. That, that was kind of the concept is just deciding to go after, instead of planning for the life of our dreams, which we had been doing for years to say, 
we're starting it right now. We're going to put it into action. I love that. I love that. <laughs> so as a kid, other than um, you coming out, you know, with your airplane, <laughs> like your mom said, <laughs> um, what were some other, what would you say? How are you in school? Like, how are you as a student in school, would you say? Started off really strong. Elementary school was very strong. Got good grades. Uh, I always was uh, I battled daydreaming a lot. So I would daydream through a lot of stuff, but luckily uh, it didn't affect my <laughs> grades or my ability to learn. Yeah. Uh, started reading at a very early age. My mom says I taught myself to read when I was like four. So um, that, yes. that really helped. And I really enjoyed math. So I had a, a good mix that helped me do really well. But and in junior high, probably the the catalyst for change was girls, girlfriends. Mm. And, you know, that really becoming a distraction. And so I started getting C's, uh, <laughs> which I thought was awful, but nothing compared to what was to come in high school. <laughs> but just spent all my time thinking about girls and, um, you know, hanging out with girlfriends and just trying to, I don't know, find my way socially, I guess. And, uh, well, so I wanted to ask you about that because INTPs tend to not have a lot of game because they social interaction, like extroverted feeling, which is harmonizing in a social situation, kind of knowing, you know, what to do in a social situation, which is basically your wife, Erin, is completely comfortable in that that yeah. is your most inferior function and so what an intp tends to do is tell it like it is blunt without any frills like you know you'll see truth you'll see absurdity and you'll say that's stupid you know just playing it on out you'll call people on their bs you know their belief system i got that from personality hacker you'll, you'll call them on their <laughs> bs you know and you don't sugarcoat it and so so tell me how that played out and how you were able to kind of get your game to, to you know, have girlfriends and all that. I was awful at it. And I think a lot <laughs> hasn't changed. I mean, in terms of those types of interactions, social interactions, uh -huh. I feel mm -hmm. pretty much the same way going to a party today that I would have in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily, I mean, I never, I, I don't know when I first asked a girl out, I was probably in my mid twenties. And so I was able to rely on uh, just having some girls to essentially ask me out. Uh, I remember my first girlfriend, Becky, in junior high, and uh -huh. she made everything happen. You know, it was like nice me effort into the initial outreach. You know, getting that ball rolling. Um, I would. It was low hanging fruit for me. Whichever girls talked to me and initiated, and that I would found attractive in some way, shape, or form. Those are the, those are the relationships that happened. Right. So. It's not that you had these dating relationships, which were causing you to get C's. It was just that your your mind was elsewhere, not on your studies. Yes. Yeah. Now, did you did you get really good grades? Well, you said you got C's, but were you able to do well on tests like without studying, even though, you know, because INTPs, what I've seen in, in the kids that I've worked with and the families I worked with is that they might be playing video games. 24 seven, not doing well in their grades, but then they ace the SAT or the ACT because they're just mm -hmm. brilliantly smart. Mm -hmm. I didn't have straight C's, which is to say that I actually had, uh, you know, really good grades in certain subjects and then poor grades in other subjects. So any of those like math where everything was just kind of logical and I, you could figure it out, I wouldn't have to do homework. I wouldn't have to pay attention in class and I could still test very well. And, and I got mm -hmm. it up to a certain point. Once we got into algebra, that changed because there were new concepts that you have to learn. You have to, you had to, you have to be taught the concepts. Yeah. But so like social studies was the very first class that I started doing poorly. And I didn't find it particularly interesting at the time. Yeah. And you can't make up, you know, history or yeah. Global, you know, geopolitics. I mean, you have to learn that stuff. You have to read it. So without doing right. that, my grades really started to drop there. Same thing with right. literature. You're not going to score well in, a, in a, a test about Macbeth if you don't read Macbeth. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. So how, how were your parent, how were you parented? Like what, what would you say your parents did well? What would you say they didn't understand about you? Were they trying to 
kind of force a square peg into a round hole sometimes because you're this really unique temperament? You know, we had such a dynamic childhood. My parents, my mom and dad were polar opposites, which is potentially what led to them divorcing when I was in first grade. Okay. Um, but I was born, uh, I have an older brother who was adopted. He was a foster kid shortly before I was born. And then I have a biological sister who's only about a year and a half younger. And then my parents adopted a girl from Korea. And this was all when I was still like kindergarten age, essentially. And then they enjoyed that Korean adoption experience so much. They brought four more foster kids over from Korea. So we had eight kids. Wow. Living in the house. So there was just so much change in terms of, you know, what parenting was like and what my relationship with my parents was like, what my... My, my position within the whole family was like so there wasn't there wasn't real consistency at that period of time um my parents were good parents parents they're you know like no kind of abuse whatsoever verbal anything like that um they were very focused on effective communication. I do remember one time I was like, just kind of lightly kicking um, one of my sisters while she was standing in front of the mirror, I was just kind of like kicking her butt lightly, playing around again, first grade or something. And she started crying. And then my parents, uh, I remember they called me down and they were like, so let's talk about that. You know, that's not the way to behave. And it kind of seems like, do you want attention? Because if you want attention, all you need to do is come to us and say, mom, dad, I kind of need some attention right now. And so I remember using that then repeatedly after that. Sometimes I'd be like, I just feel like I need attention. So I'd go to I need some attention. And you know, they'd drop everything and give me some attention. Um, again, so that was that's a that's so interesting. Something so simple, such a simple tool, really helped you out. Now, somebody, so INTPs do have a lot of social anxiety. And I have worked with a lot of INTPs that like it really is debilitating for them like giving a speech uh, a pub you know public speaking it, uh you know it's scary for everyone but to the point of where they want to throw up it's just debilitating anxiety when it comes to putting yourself out there because intps are very self-contained they're very confident when they're on their own and they're very confident in their belief system and their value system um, and their intelligence and all that. But when they put it out there in the world for people to observe, that's when they get very, very anxious. So I'm wondering if, if you experienced any of that. Yeah, to get back to school and, um, you know, having to get up in front of the class and do presentations. I don't remember that being much of an issue, but anything else where I felt like I was being called upon to perform in some way, shape or form, certainly uncomfortable and is to this day. Um, I don't dance, never have danced because I feel like it's performing. <laughs> but I saw <laughs> you on Instagram dancing with your wife at some function. I saw that. So you, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, 